Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to do this for me, man. I really appreciate it. And I like, I don't know. I feel like this is something that I've wanted to do for a while just because there's one, because I'm curious, but like two, there's just like always kind of this, like, I don't know for a normie to like understand how like the industry works. I think it's very out of reach. Um, so it's good and nice that we kind of have somebody like you in the community to kind of be that little bit of a link between us and like the big companies and such like stuff like that. Yeah. The game industry right now is a pretty hot topic with all the controversies going on right now between games like hell divers and oh my god uh the, the people behind escape from tarkov there's just like uh, and all the crazy stuff going on with sony and then obviously people are always curious about lost ark and how smile gate's relation with ags is and all that stuff yeah and that's kind of like one of the main things that i really wanted to get you on here today to talk about but kind of before we go all into that uh that type of stuff and dive deep into it, i guess you know begin with like how are you doing how's everything going like how's life it's been fun for the most part i think i changed up my schedule pretty recently so now i'm just doing two days of lost ark and then i go play other games like a little vacation for five days come back do it again and then that's been that so i've been a little disconnected as of late because mm. most of the people that i hang out with are lost ark folks but if i'm yep. only seeing them two days a week then five days i am completely out of the loop with sometimes with the community and friends and everything everything uh and then besides for that it's just um wake up lift sleep eat <laughs> stream sleep just repeat over and over <laughs> that's it's, something it's been a very it's very very mundane it's like interesting because like i feel like as like a somebody who's recently been trying to break into the space it, it honestly as mundane as normal work day was i feel like ever since i've started to stream and do youtube and stuff like that it feels even more so like every day is like kind of the same as the other it's just like Maybe it's because I don't have any weekends. Like before it was like one to Monday to Friday, it's like work. And then for weekends, it'll like kind of break up the week. But like every single day is kind of like the same thing nowadays. Yeah, I lose track of what day it is all the time. I, I actually did. I didn't even know the interview was today for the record. <laughs> I, woke up, I, woke, I woke up and I was like, shit. <laughs> Hopefully this isn't running into anything in your schedule or like making things worse for your life or anything like that. No, no it's all good. It's it's at least it helped me gather my bearings a bit. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 all, all this reminded me was okay. In two days, it's weekly reset. I got I got I have two, <laughs> the two more days. Important stuff. The important <laughs> things in life. <laughs> got it. Got it. Awesome. But I guess you know as we kind of jump into this, I'd love. I mean, everybody know here probably knows who you are and you know everything, but. But if you just introduce yourself, just in case there's anybody know doesn't know, like your name, what you currently do, and like you know maybe like how long have you been playing Lost Ark for? Mm. Um, I'm saying a probably one of the older uh, content creators for Lost Ark. I've been around the Lost Ark scene since it came out in Korea five years ago. I was been on and off with streaming since then, but. Uh, I've been playing since closed beta two in Korea. Oh, wow. Played it for quite some time, took some time off to focus on work, then played it some more when season two came out. Um, also played it a little bit on the Russian region, the Japanese region, and here and there on the Western region when that came out two years ago or so. Uh, and yeah, I just try and focus on just gameplay mostly. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I, I I used to try and make guides, but then I just started getting really frustrated making guides. Really? Why so? Uh, maybe maybe you understand because you know you're you're a content creator too. Just mm -hmm. the idea of making something that can become outdated, That's true. Um, and then it lives on the internet forever. Like one of my most viewed videos is my sorceress guide. Mm -hmm. That thing is so out of date. And just the idea that someone who starts Lost Ark might type into YouTube, like Lost Ark sorceress guide, and then that video comes out, and then it's just just way wrong information. 
Mm-hmm. It just skeeves the hell. I actually I had to go into my video and put outdated in parentheses in the title just because it bothered me that much. I've done that too with a video before. This was like way before I got into Lost Ark. I made like this Genshin Impact video, and like you know people are like it's you know this is completely wrong. I'm like I'm sorry guys, this was made a long time ago. And then I literally went in like you said, I put outdated right at the beginning of the title, and it's like. It, Did luckily. you come from Genshin before Lost Ark? No. So, I mean, for me, in terms of like content creation, I came from, um, of course, very, very early days. My first couple YouTube videos were actually focused on MapleStory 2 because um, mm. I used to play a shit ton of MapleStory 2. And then um, started doing some like gacha game stuff. I played a lot of Epic 7, another Smiley Gate game, um, played another game called Exos Heroes. But like, I've always been kind of like on and off with content creation until very recently. It's just been like things I did on my free time and like things that I really enjoyed doing, but never really had the time to do. But then, you know, with kind of recent changes in events with my life and stuff like that, I decided to try to take on content creation as a full-time thing. Still trying to, you know, make it work out. Hasn't, not really quite there yet, but cross my fingers no i think i think i think it's been going really well because whenever i go to my youtube because i wasn't sub to your youtube Mm -hmm. but for some reason your videos kept getting plastered all over my (laughs) page and i was like i'm sorry this guy's doing something right because the algorithm's working in his favor Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i'm trying my best i'm trying my best hopefully one of these days i can actually make it as a full-time guy but at the moment still just barely barely not even barely making it but you know trying my best and you know i always say this i'm gonna be sitting here and uh you know trying this ride till i die basically um making it trying to do this until i run out of money basically Mm, well i mean if it's any constellation you know most people don't make it past five viewers so (laughs) i think you've got a good foothold and a good start and i you know the work ethic is there thank you i mean i'm trying i'm trying um but yeah i guess with that you've been playing lost ark for quite a while right now like like you said since closed beta basically from its infancy to where it is today like Mm. with all of that time going by and like all the changes and iterations with the game like what do you think about the game now comparing it to where it was back then I think there's always pain points associated when you're playing an MMO, especially a Korean MMO. I mean, Korean MMO and like frustrating or bad progression designs, they almost go hand in hand. You know, every single Korean MMO features these things. And we all know why they exist. They they're there to inhibit your progress so that you have to play the game longer. It's so that you don't reach the finish line so that you know, you are always grinding towards something. Mm-hmm. It's the uh, the proverbial carrot on the stick. Oh, 100%. And back in the day, the game used to... It, it, we use the same um, saying, right? The carrot on the stick. It used to have the stick, but no carrot on the end. And it would just mm-hmm. hold it out in front of you. And the problem with the game back then was it started off great yep but as time goes on they had to implement systems that were increasingly worse and worse because back then when the game came out some of the things that we're doing today that we would find annoying we just took it at face value and just kind of we're like okay i mean we can put up with this 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 isn't the worst thing in the world like here's an example we used to do three cube runs every day Mm -hmm. three three cube runs every day um because we were given three tickets and the three tickets you could either use on cube platinum field or tower mm. the the 50 floors the shade spire tower that thing you had your choice of entering either of those contents or any of those contents with those three tickets and almost everybody used cube or did cube because at that time that was the only source of gold in lost ark there was no gold from raids there were no adventure islands there was nothing Literally That's every single gold crazy. you got came from Cube. And uh, like we didn't think anything of it. It was just like, okay, this is our gold source. So we'd go in, get the bronze cube after like two rooms and then exit. And that was, <laughs> and we'd do that three times and we'd do that every day. Um, 
Granted, at the time, you know, Lost Ark wasn't like an alt heavy game, so you'd only do it on one or two characters. But still, it was three cubes every day, which is kind of more than most people do in general. Like, I, I, I probably touch cube content once like a month, maybe <laughs> today. <laughs> And it was old cube. It's not new cube today. Yeah. It, was, it was the it was the old one where you go from room to room. Um, and the progression systems in, in general were, were very different as well. We started off with a system called Acrasium. And then by the time they released Yorn as a content, we we had a system that was basically a worse system of what we have today, where you had to like gather these three different components and then, you know, you'd have a chance at upgrading it. Uh every time you went to an NPC, but you know, there were certain like materials that you needed that were just a, they were unfarmable. Like we didn't have chaos dungeon guardian raid drops mm -hmm. uh, of, of like uh, the, the obliteration stones and the, the armor stones and whatnot. It, it's like, you could, you couldn't really farm is the thing. And so we had this like weird problem where the game was pay to win, but you also couldn't grind mm -hmm. either. Your only choice was to essentially pay. And that's why like I talked about like Lost Ark being more of a pay to win game back then than it is today. And it's it's super strange, but it has to do with the fact that even though you can spend way more money today, like you can buy an Esther weapon and what that well, that'll set you back like what fifty grand? Yep. Fifty grand plus. <laughs> that's a lot of money. Back then, you know, you couldn't really spend more than like ten to 15 grand and that's still a lot of money but that was like the upper limit of what you could really spend but the thing is like if you wanted power in any capacity like reaching the end game you kind of had to spend into the thousands and into that territory that there wasn't a grinding option at least today people are making it to Thamine 1640 they're grinding some of them are grinding hard some of them are bussing some of them are emptying but the point is, you know, the option is technically there where they could grind. And that's that's the difference what separates today from before. Um, and then if we talk about there's like this whole rabbit hole of like quality of lives. Obviously, the game is way better today and a lot more convenient. Mm -hmm. um, but if we're just talking strictly progression systems, it was uh, it was a lot rougher back then, especially the end game content was a lot more of a drought. I mean, back then, Guardian Raids were our end game. Yeah. Wait. So if there was like basically no way to gain gold outside of cube and you were basically forced to pay to win in the game like why did people even play the game back then it didn't the game almost died it was on its last legs before oh. season two smilegate back then had to talk about how you know they messed up their design philosophy was wrong and they were going to basically reboot the game in with season two back then in tier three mm -hmm. and once that happened which i you know I'm assuming did happen. Um, a lot of people came back to the game. Oh yeah, they they did like a like a little like reboot essentially. They were like, we're gonna get rid of this system. We're gonna get rid of this system. We're gonna get rid of this one. This is how it's gonna work from now on. Tier three is gonna drop. Uh, this is what our progression systems are gonna be like. They did like a big promotional campaign. They got a lot of streamers and content creators on board. And when season two dropped, it was better, flawed, but better. There, mm -hmm. there were still plenty of issues at the very beginning of season two, which made themselves very apparent with the Japanese version when that came out on how on the problems of season two at that time. God, I mean, I, I don't know if you know this, but I actually did. When I first started playing Lost Ark, I actually played the Japanese version because I didn't quite want to play the Russian version for some reason, because I guess maybe Japan was closer to us. I'm like, oh, Ping's probably a little, a little better. And then, of course, Korean has its own kind of hurdles to get in and barrier of entry. So I actually did start off playing the Japanese version. And yeah, mm. it was very different from Lost Ark that we had today. Yeah, it was it was weird. It was like uh, we had season two. And the funny thing is, um, season two and all of its systems were actually implemented on the Japanese open beta before it was implemented on the Korean version. Interesting. And so we actually got a glimpse of the season two systems through the JP beta. And then eventually the JP launch happened. And then at that time we had this idea, 
Oh, they messed up big time because season two of Lost Ark with all of its system revamps were essentially designed around an existing like region and server that already had some economy moving and a player base established that when you put it on a brand new server, you had people running around like, how do I make gold? There's no there's because, like, you know, they, they didn't have cube anymore to make gold. So people were like going to like Tukey Island. Mm-hmm. and grouping up to to get their gold they were like getting 20 gold a day from tukey island and they, they had no they had no idea on, on how to actually make gold and make any progress in the game yeah because it was like a completely different system basically and that nobody had ever experienced before and with lost ark and a lot of korean mmos honestly there's not a lot of hand holding with you know how to like play the game and how to progress right yeah they they tend to have a lot of systems um and even if they're explained in game, honestly, most people don't really read it anyway. <laughs> shifty, 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 shifty. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, yeah, having been playing Korean MMOs for a while, I totally understand that. And, but like overall, you would probably say Lost Ark is much better today than it was back then, even, you know, season two before season two and such, right? Yeah, I, I think so. I think, I think um, there's, a lot more dailies are a lot shorter weeklies are a lot more interesting um the only downside i would say to today is there's just way more systems that people need to acquaint themselves with and work towards and it can be very overwhelming and frustrating since a lot of these systems have rng tied to them yeah but that's definitely nothing new to people who are used to playing korean mmos at all they're just- sure but unfortunately, with Lost Ark, <laughs> this is many people's either first Korean MMO or first MMO in general. Very, I mean, very, very true. Like, yeah, I think Lost Ark kind of reached this level of like success and like, I don't know, like popularity, especially at the beginning of the game that I honestly don't think that they even expected, right? Yeah, I, I don't think so either, because, you know, at that time, I remember Smilegate was so proud to say, oh, we have 700,000 concurrent users overseas on the uh-huh. Western servers. And like at the time, of the game, there was a lot of bots. So yep. <laughs> they, were, they were lumping bots into that statistic, but they were like, look what we did. We're so proud of this. Um no, but you're you're right. Uh, Lost Ark, as far as Korean MMOs go, was the most mainstream of Korean MMOs. Um, just tons of content creators bringing their audiences, tons of like huge streamers that heard about the game back in 2015 that were willing to try try it and and, and play it for a little while, sponsor or not just because they were curious about this game that they heard about just many, many years ago that they were excited for that finally came out in the West. Yeah, and it was a game that really respected your time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of people saw that video, saw your video with the Brelshaza run and all of that, mm. and we're just like really, really impressed with the game and we're excited to hop on. And honestly, I think... A lot of people loved the game a lot when the first game first came out. But then when they started to hit Endgame, when they started to hit some of those classic Korean MMO systems, I think that's kind of where everything started. I guess the illusions kind of started breaking, right? A lot of people first saw this. It was uh, it was around the time where people started reaching the 1340 to 1370 dead zone. Mm-hmm. And they just couldn't make any meaningful progress. People made pretty good progress up until about 1340-ish. And then after that, it just got real bad. Yeah. And I mean, I think there was like that whole thing of like Shroud spending like thousands of dollars making it like 1400 or something like that. And like all this yep. news about like how it was impossible to get to Argos without like paying to win and having that huge backlash there. And like, I don't know, it really kind of made it super apparent that there were so many players that had never kind of seen these systems in games before. And, um, you know, I don't know. One cemented Lost Ark in its mainstream popularity, but two kind of was really showing why 
Lost Ark and many other Korean MMOs aren't quite like mainstream MMOs for us here in the West. Yeah, the game, um, it, it showered you with stuff, then you get to tier three, and then it kind of stops showering you with stuff. And then you're like, oh, maybe I'll check the auction house. And you were on NA West. You saw, mm -hmm. you you were there. You, you saw the, the leap stones at their peak were a thousand gold for a leap stone. It was crazy. <laughs> it was absolutely insane. And so now you had this other problem where if you if you didn't get to tier three quickly, you were missing out on an opportunity to basically sell these mats to what was more or less people who are RMTing because there's no way a reasonable person would buy these mats. Um, and then they came up with this new problem where if you didn't bring up a bunch of alts with you, to tier three, you couldn't really farm mats and you couldn't take advantage of that money making opportunity or be able to funnel mats to raise your your main character. And then people started getting burnt out real fast because now they had to raise all these alts. And then, you know, that's when I was getting kind of like a, a little bit worried because I was also telling people, you know, hey, it's really beneficial to have alts yep. and Lost Ark. It's super beneficial you know, consider a roster of like six characters. And while that was true for a short while, that's definitely not true today. And mm -hmm. it wasn't true not long after Argos, after they started implementing a lot of the um, like progression, like permanent honing bonuses, and people were actually able to get through that dead zone. I wouldn't say that it was necessary to have like six characters anymore. I, th I think if, if, if I knew back then that progression would get easier, I wouldn't have recommended that because I think it ended up burning out tons of people. Yeah. And I mean, I remember you making that whole kind of video like, well, you were kind of doing like kind of like a fireside chat ish type of situation where you recap like the director's note and you like even like apologize to people like, hey, I'm really sorry if I made you guys think that this was the case because it was the case for us in Korea and kind of basically told a bunch of people that you need to make all these alts. But, you know, you know, I, I thought honestly thought that was a great video and I don't know. I don't think you should be super hard on yourself either about that. Like it is. I, mean, I guess it's just knowing me. that what the, the damage it did as far as like people's enjoyment goes, because I mean, I'm, I'm sure most people in, in chat remember is it was not, <laughs> it was not simple or easy to raise an alt back then. You had to run it through the, the story uh they they definitely make the, it, it it was it was a pain in the ass to bring characters to tier 3 back then and so to do that mm -hmm. like five times after your first character it wasn't uh it wasn't yeah. a fun experience which is what people were looking for mhm mm mm -hmm. i mean yeah but i mean luckily we're kind of past that at the moment and i think that I mean, as much as the new player experience, we could go all into that topic completely, but I like, you know, and talk about a ton of things. But I think that overall, the game itself is a lot more streamlined in terms of like progressing through the item levels right now and like a lot of easier ways with like power passes and like honing events and like with Coco Express to help us kind of get through a lot of those rough patches for people who do want to step into the game these days. Yeah, of course. It doesn't come without its own issues, catapulting new yeah. players into these high-level areas with high-level raids, which, yeah, sure, they're nerfed, but, I mean, to to have to learn um, Brelshaza, Akan, uh, Voldus, Kangle, all within, like, your first, like, two months of playing the game is... It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a tall task. And, on top of all the systems yeah and i don't know how they're gonna be ultimately implementing solo raids eventually but i think they said that's gonna go all the way up to like theamine and if they put Voldus. it all in the oh sorry Voldus, and if they put a bunch of like solo raids into the game and people's first raids like you know people playing with other people depending on how they implement it like is Voldus theamine like I feel like it's just a lot of stuff for people to kind of take in and like learn and really be able to do later on. So we'll kind of have to see how that ends up playing out. And I hope they kind of have a plan for that. I'm hoping so as well. To me, I think that solo raids are probably the single most important thing that they can do. 
just because many people who start this game they want to learn and play the game at their own pace you know the rating is all lost Ark has it's it's mm -hmm. the only reason people really and ultimately play this game besides besides for like the strict gameplay it's the gameplay and the raids we we put up with all the bad systems in lost Ark because there's n literally no other mmo that is the same it, it, there's mm -hmm. no other mmo that has great combat great classes and great raids that are action combat specifically it's a very specific niche that that fortunately lost ark stands alone at because if there was a game that had similar combat and that was auction combat and it had great raids you know i think a lot of people would move on from lost ark yeah. just to get away from some of the more frustrating systems that have tired people out mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 100 percent, and you know we'll as much as we like to, many people like to say lost ark is currently at least in the west kind of like a dying game it would be even more so if this was the case and the other games kind of came in and kind of ate their lunch yeah awesome well i mean we've talked a lot about lost ark specifically but that's not really kind of the point that and the reason why I brought you in. Of course, one, I like wanted to get you in here and talk to you because one, I think you're super cool. And I've always kind of wanted to chat with you and like learn more about you as a person, but also like your perspectives into Lost Ark. But I kind of brought you in here and wa really wanted to talk to you because you actually worked in an MMO publishing company before and another mm -hmm. game company as well, right? Before you became a full time streamer. That's right. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? So uh, at the time of uh, like five years ago, I was streaming, but I wasn't really making much money from streaming. And, you know, my parents were giving me a hard time. They were like, what was the point of going to college and studying <laughs> science if you're just going to be playing video games? And then um, I saw a job recruitment from Nexon and they were looking for a, uh, a POC, a point of contact, to work as a... Um, layway between Nexon Korea and Nexon America and to mm -hmm. kind of help work um, out the Maple Story 2 launch because Maple Story 2 had come out not long before that um, and they, they needed a point of contact to work between Nexon Korea and Nexon America and not really many people applied to it but the um, the CEO knew of me mm -hmm. and so I, my my chat had egged me on to apply because they knew my situation was kind of dire yeah and then i applied and then like two three months later i after uh se several rounds of interviews i ended up getting the job uh and the job essentially asked me to move to korea for a short well during the t the term of me working there um to help with communications between the two branches, uh, Nexon Korea, which was developing the game, and Nexon America, which was publishing it in the West. Um, and so I worked with community and marketing um, and internal communications within Nexon to uh, facilitate that. And then I worked there for about three years. Um, and then the same guy who had hired me left to start uh, a brand new company because he had like new ventures and mm -hmm. ideas and I got offered like this great uh you know increase to my salary and a mm -hmm. title increase if I you know uh, went with him and essentially got poached and that was that and then I worked there for like a year and then that was that was that but um yeah during that time when I was working at Nexon I I, I got to learn a lot of the intrinsics regarding how a game is made and run and how it's distributed to publishers mm -hmm. and it shed a lot of light on the actual operations that goes into running a game that was originally made in one region and then brought to another region afterwards the logistics issues as well as why these games can't be synced because um if we look at Korean MMOs as a whole, the whole genre, and even some Japanese MMOs, you'll notice that there actually is no MMO that was initially released in a home region 
that was later then released in another region that would then sync their updates together. Mm -hmm. It's either they start together synced or they stay forever staggered. And the the entire reason behind that is the publisher. It, it actually all comes down to the publisher, um, the bottlenecks in operations when it comes to making the patch, bringing it to the publisher, and then the publisher has to localize it, market it, all that kind of stuff, implements it, LQA, all these things that go into it that if they didn't would essentially hamper the pacing of updates altogether for every region. Got it, got it. So basically, because of everything that kind of happens when the game gets i guess the game is created by the developer but then when it gets handed over to the publisher in another region all the things that they need to do with localizing and making the game you know operating and playable by the people in that region because of that kind of process it ends up being that you can't really get a hundred percent sync between the two regions yeah, I mean, the more the more regions that a game has to service, the the more headcount they have to bring on to create these individual versions. I mean, now at Smilegate, they have to have a group of developers that develop the the Korean version of the game. Then they need a group of developers who are making Western patches, mm -hmm. Russian patches, Chinese patches, and each of these are their own Frankenstein. And usually they have different teams for this, but I mean, oftentimes or not, they have to pull from each other's teams in order to make it work. And then obviously all of these different versions, they come with more modern classes, more modern quality of life. And that, that adds to this, like the spaghetti code of, of, of issues. And it, it creates things like bugs that may not have existed in the Korean version, but now exist in these versions just because the code is, is different. Um, we talk about localization as being one of the bottlenecks involved, but there's more of the bottlenecks. There's there's marketing. Uh, again, there's um, not only uh, localization, but there's LQA, which is localization QA. There's QA, uh, which is its own <laughs> uh, mess, I guess. I, I've learned mm -hmm. that Korean QA or QA in general tends to be quite a bit of a mess when it comes to live service games and um these month by month updates it's it, it's it's just they're always working there's no downtime <laughs> <laughs> when you say korean localization specifically is that like something an issue you feel like is specifically with korean um companies or is that just like uh i don't know just something you just called out I think it's mostly associated with Korean games because for the most part, most games that release in the world release worldwide. Mm -hmm. Got yeah. it, got it. So it's not like, you know, it's because you feel like most Korean games a lot of times end up being released worldwide as opposed to like a lot of, you know, let's say Japanese games stay in Japan and stay local and don't kind of reach outside of the, the country. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there is that. I, I mean, Japan in general is they, they don't really release that many MMOs. I mean, they have a handful, but they're really just mostly known for Final Fantasy fourteen, maybe PSO as well. And PSO took forever to release overseas. Mm -hmm. um, and even Final Fantasy faces these issues. Final Fantasy released mostly worldwide for the most part, but there's two regions that um square enix doesn't handle which is china and korea uh and it's very funny because it's kind of like a sh like a shoe on the other foot kind of deal where those two regions are essentially handled by other publishers and those two regions are behind on patches yep because you know they they don't get the same updates as everyone else at the same time they have to be handed a version from square enix and then they have to go through that process as well so whereas normally korea is like ahead on patches and games yeah. in the case of ff14 it's actually the exact opposite yeah because usually the games are developed in korea and then handed out to publishers elsewhere whereas this time it's yes. developed in japan and then handed out to korea um, as opposed to the other way around that makes a it's, lot of sense it's crazy because we're in 2024 and like 
people still don't know the difference between a publisher and a developer. And they're not really <laughs> expected to know. Uh -huh. And I, I wouldn't expect them to know. But this only comes up because of the recent controversies regarding Helldivers 2. Have you been mm -hmm. following that at all? A bit, a bit. So the story of Helldivers 2 immensely popular game uh yep. people, like huge success people loved it it was just this really really good game that everyone was playing and um hell divers as an ip so the mm -hmm. name hell divers the story everything associated with hell divers is owned by sony mm -hmm. sony interactive uh, and entertainment and they hired arrowhead studios which was a indie publisher known for games like magicka super old school game mm -hmm. i played the shit out of that game it was a good game right and they hired uh arrowhead to make hell divers back in 2015 and that was to a pretty good amount of success and then five years later they would bring on arrowhead again to make the sequel hell divers 2 and if you're an indie studio like Arrowhead, right, mm -hmm. the opportunity to work with Square Enix is kind of a big deal. Yeah. Because Square Enix was not really a subject of controversy back in 2020, and they certainly were not a subject of controversy back in 2015. And so if 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 you're this indie studio Arrowhead, you're like, oh yeah, this is great. This is this is gonna be awesome for our studio. We're we'll make uh plenty of money doing this, we'll get our name out there. And so obviously they, they accepted, regardless of what Sony's terms were back then. I, I, I see that they uh Renee back like two hours ago and yielded on that. But yeah. The thing I is like that. you're you're a developer, you want to make a great game, you have this opportunity to make this great game, you're a very small studio overall, you make the game, and then you make you're making it for someone else who owns the name. And then that same person is going to be the one distributing the game afterwards, right? Mm -hmm. Literally, your only job is to make the game, <laughs> more or less. Yep. And uh, they make the game, and then the the whole controversy happens, and then people are attacking them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, yes, they. Uh, on one hand, they are probably aware of Sony's demands and, and the PSN activation later on down the line. On the other hand, you know, I'm sure that they weren't thinking that this was their responsibility. Literally, their responsibility was just to make the game. <laughs> you know, the mm -hmm. publisher would handle that afterwards, which is Square Enix, but they're the developer. So why are they getting the flack for it? All they did was make the game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if this muddies the water at all, but like because of how like going back to the Lost Ark situation, like Smilegate is the developer and the distributor publisher for Lost Ark in Korea, but is not the case for some of the other regions, like for us, for example, for the Western version. Do you think that the relationship is a little bit different in that case? Because in this situation with the Helldivers, it really feels like, you know, the developers are very much not in the driver's seat of this entire situation and like really a lot of the blame is to put on sony but i feel like with a lot of the things that happen with lost ark and maybe it's because a lot of the ha things that happen in lost ark aren't really publisher issues but they're kind of developer and like systems issues um do you think that that relationship kind of is a little bit different uh in our case or do you think it's mostly like the same and just because of the issues in the game are very much different than in this situation with Helldivers. It's kind of the perception that we have here. Well, oftentimes or not, the publisher doesn't own the IP. That's mm -hmm. kind of like a rarity. Normally, the, the, the developer owns the IP, and then they work with a publisher to get the game out there. In the case of Helldivers, it was the opposite. The publisher held the IP, and so a lot of the decision-making essentially was on them. Um, and how they decided they wanted to distribute the games, require these PSN requirements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In the case of Lost Ark and Korean games in general, the IP is typically held by the developer or the parent company, and then as they give these, as they develop these working relationships with these other regions, they have their requirements in place. And these other re these these publishers, it, it, it's, it's strictly business, you know. Mm -hmm. They are. Um, working out contracts and terms in order to 
distribute the game in their home region. In the case of Russia, we've got uh, Mail.ru. In the case of China, it's Tencent. And in the case of the West, it's Amazon uh, Game Studios. And their job is solely the day-to-day -day operations, the marketing campaigns, the community management, all that kind of stuff. Um, the the QA on the, the different bills that get sent out. But if we're talking about like making the like, game changing design decisions, that is not their job. Mm -hmm. They can give feedback, but at the end of the day, if the developers back in Korea don't think that that feedback is good long term, they're they're not going to do it. And the reality is, most of these publishers, the people who work at them, they're not fans of the game. They're not they're not people who are passionate about the game. It's it's just a job to them. Mm -hmm. When when I was working at Nexon, I was put on many games that I wasn't entirely passionate about. Like I was originally on to work on Maple Story Two, and I got to do a lot of great stuff and fun stuff with that. Uh, even like design stuff, which wasn't even in my job like description, getting to do design stuff because I played the game a lot. They yeah. allowed me to work on some of those things, but um, eventually I got put on projects like. The original Maple Story, or Bob mm -hmm. and Ogie, or Cart Rider Drift, and I wasn't really passionate about these games, so I was just kind of doing slightly more than the bare minimum yep. while working on these games. And I feel like that's most of these people in general. They they're not super passionate about the game. They're just doing a job. They're doing what they have to do, and then they clock out for the day, and then eventually they get put on a different project that again they might not be passionate about and you know, the cycle repeats and so typically these publishers the people that are working at them they're probably not going to be sending that much feedback over outside of what players are saying and the reality of things is um if there's anything that i've ever learned in my time in the video game industry it is players are the best at identifying problems but terrible at finding solutions and it's not their job to find solutions it's the developer's job to find root cause solutions to the problems that players are kind of highlighting yeah and i mean kind of this really leads me to think about this next question that i have about like issues in games and like you said is the developer that ultimately is required to fix them but if we have a situation where developers and people like your situation where you're put onto games that you didn't really care about, right? Um, when that happens, is it really, does it get into the situation where it's like people talk about, oh, you know, they don't play their game. Like how would they know? Like they, they don't know the issues because they don't play their game. Like, is that true? Do the developers yeah, really, uh, absolutely. Don't play the, they don't play the game? No, no the developers, some of them do, but again, like even even in Korea, many of the developers who make the game don't play the game. That's <laughs> that is that is not their job. Um, we I actually have this story when I left Nexon to work at this other company, ODS. Um, we, the the company was in its infancy, and it was it, it, it was a developing company. It wasn't a publishing company. We were developers trying to make indie games, and I remember they had brought on a few developers who were super excited to like make like a new game from scratch. And in their entire first year at ODS, all that they were working on was developing a custom engine. They didn't actually mm -hmm. get to make anything, and I remember they were just so not happy with their job because they thought they'd be doing way cooler and more exciting things. Mm. But in reality, for their first year, they were just working on a custom engine. And um, it, it, it's the truth. Many people who work on video games, they're just, it's it's just a job to them. They don't play the game themselves. It's, it, they're, if you're working in marketing, you're just finding ways, you're doing market research and you're marketing the game, you're not going home and you're playing the game afterwards. If you're doing QA, sometimes you'll play the game too, but for the most part, you're going off of a checklist and just mm -hmm. making sure that the current version, you know, this, this, and this is working and maybe it's causing some issues behind that down the line, but you're mm -hmm. not, if you're not passionate about the game, you're not able to quickly identify things that shouldn't be there. You're just looking, oh, is this thing on the checklist working correctly? Is this thing working on the checklist correctly? Yeah. And um, that that's just across the board. Sometimes I do play the game. Like AGS, 
Um, Henry, for example, yep. is like a great example of this. Henry, he's an end game player. He's doing fame mine and stuff like that. But I think he's the only person on the AGS team that is that passionate about the game and everyone else. They're just kind of doing it as a job. Yep. And it's also very different because Henry's on the publishing side of the things as well, yeah. and not the developers. We, we we do know that some of the developers do play the game, like some of their characters are known. But I mean, it's a big company. I I would say only a small fraction of them are actually actively playing as like regular players outside of work. Got it. And do you think that that's kind of one of the reasons why a lot of the well, I mean, there's the whole thing about like, and you talked about this earlier. It's like, and I hear I. Per, I prescribe to this kind of notion of like when it comes to pay to win games, problems are created by the developers so that players will pay for those solutions. And so those problems aside, do you think that a, one of the reasons why like a lot of the problems that exist in games in general, whether it's Lost Ark or other, any other MMO, a lot of times it exists because the developer and the people on those teams don't really play the game and so they don't really understand the player experience i think it's a very cynical outlook but i mean it is true to a degree pay to win has its histories and has its roots in korean live service mm -hmm. uh, the first game that really implemented pay to win as a feature of the game as awful as that might sound <laughs> Is essentially Maple Story back in yep. the early 2000s. Maple Story is considered the the, the father of all pay to win games. Lovely, uh, historically, and um, I, I think especially because these games are created in Korea, which has this very very different culture and outlook on pay to win and how people perceive it and how people accept it, which has uh, been formed over the last 20 or so years, the last two decades. People see pay to win as something they tolerate and as something that if you don't have the time to grind, then you use the money and mm -hmm. more or less people have accepted that, uh, culturally, you know, you either put in the time or you put in the money. And so these games, which are essentially designed to be very grindy over time, implemented monetization that a is to the benefit of the company. Cause it's just an insane amount of money that the the free to play pay to win space has created but b gives people the option to play the game because they were designed always to be grindy and some people literally cannot grind and so for them to actually play the game as working salarymen they use their money mm -hmm. and so I'd, i would i would say that it's just culturally very different uh, between between regions, which does end up affecting the design of the game quite a lot um, because of that. Got it, got it. And I guess going back to the question of like, I guess, do you think that these problems arise? Like, where do you think these problems arise? Do they pr kind of arise because developers aren't like the people on the development teams and like um they don't have people who are like playing the game all the time and is the, the reason why people you know these problems exist like uh, again i think there's a lot of players that feel like the reason why a lot of these issues exist is like they don't play the game and when things kind of get fixed they're like oh they're finally playing their game like do you think that that's kind of the reason why a lot of these games do have these types of problems because they don't have like people who are passionate about the game and always playing it kind of like Henry is. Uh, I think just in general, creating a game, creating an MMO is an extremely difficult undertaking. Mm -hmm. We play games like God of War or uh, Baldur's Gate or so and such, uh, Hades 2, and they... They have a very finite amount of time before we get bored of them. Yep. And as far as MMOs go, MMOs essentially have to be designed that you can play them for thousands of hours and not drop the game. And that is very hard. And so because of that, sometimes um, it's very short-sighted, but developers create systems that at the time of might seem good, but over time show problems with age. And it's mm -hmm. happened countless times. I mean, we see that prominently with stuff like elixirs. Mm -hmm. Elixirs were cool for about 
maybe a month or two. <laughs> and then now people are trying to do things like min max their lines. And it's very obvious that these systems have their flaws as time goes on. Um, but they, I, 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 I do think that it's just, just general design and trying to make things that have long lasting impacts in the, in a, in a really positive way. But at the same time with, Korean developers, they're always very conscientious of the pace at which players progress at. And they're always very aware um, on how really small changes can affect player progression uh, in a large way or not. Um, and they try to avoid these things because uh, one thing with the development side is if you do something good, you, you cannot take it away afterwards. Mm -hmm. Right. But if you never do that good thing, then people are either none the wiser or they'll complain about it, but they won't get up in arms about it. Um, here's another example. You played the original Maple Story, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Many years. Then you know all about events which increase your rates of star forging, for mm -hmm. example. Yep. Yep. And people will essentially not make progression and wait for these events before they decide to pull the trigger on anything. And mm -hmm. if they don't get these events, then they will be mad. They'll be angry because they've had these events before and they know that they're essentially owed these events. Yep. That's why we don't get events like this in Lost Ark because they know if they do it once, they'll have to do it more and more in the future and people yeah. will halt their progression for it and, and all that kind of stuff. And even these kinds of things apply to things like um, mild adjustments to the amount of materials and gold that players get. You know, mm -hmm. when they introduced Fate Embers, the amount of gold that was actually being generated by players increased by quite a bit. You might not notice it because, you know, who actually gets gold from Fate Embers, but <laughs> going, going from a sample size of one to a sample size of hundreds of thousands and yeah overall the amount of gold that's being generated from chaos dungeons is significantly higher compared to when we had red and yellow portals and mm -hmm. ultimately because they are always very careful on trying to make the player experience too smooth as to prevent people from amassing too much wealth uh or or progressing too quickly faster than they can create new content, they kind of have to have these inhibitive measures in place to keep people on the hamster wheel. It sounds sad because it, it kind of is, but that is how they buy themselves time to make new content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I feel like there's a lot of people when they end up kind of stopping, like the pro like they don't play MMOs with anymore. They kind of realize this afterwards and like, yeah, I feel like I was wasting like because of all these systems that they're put in the game. They kind of felt like to them afterwards, they're like, I'm kind of wasted a lot of time that, I, uh, you know, playing these games because of how they wanted to make basically put systems in the game to keep you playing the game for a long time. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, video games are a waste of time in general, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know? but yeah, it's, especially in the case of Korean MMOs, there's there's very little downtime. Other other games like Path of Exile, Final Fantasy, you play them for a few weeks and then you're like, OK, I'm good. I can I can stop playing the game for a few months, wait until the next update. Uh, you know, you play Lost Ark, there's no downtime. You're always grinding towards the next thing. You look ahead, you see, the, oh, Korean version is releasing advanced honing, transcendence. Oh, mm -hmm. I, well, I, rather than taking a break from the game, I can keep logging in grinding and there's always this kind of feeling that if you're not playing the game you're you're not spending your time amassing wealth that you'll need later on mm -hmm. yeah and this kind of gives a sense of fomo to all the yeah. players that they end up stopping exactly know, playing the game. yeah um and i guess with that like i'd love to know like and you're obviously like you don't play the Western version of Lost Ark as much as you play the Korean version of Lost Ark. That's kind of your home. But I'm sure that you're kind of tapped into what's going on here with 
one probably whenever you do play lost ark your chat's probably talking about it and of course you live with stoops who plays in the na version um of the game i'm sure you mm -hmm. have an idea about what's going on but recently there's been a lot of talk about like the pace of release and i feel like this is actually might be an age-old question uh kind of complaint that the players have had about the game but i think it's fast with, yeah it's fast and like we're getting echidna basically a month after a month and a half after thamai releases and then now there's all these gold sinks that have been put into the game with elixirs with transcendence and then you know like do you think that this is healthy for the players like do you think that it's kind of like something that's good for the players is did, is ags doing their job do you think that they are doing this for money like why do you think this has happened and do you think it's kind of like a good thing for us uh, the pace of content recently picked up in korea and the reason why that even happened in the first place was because players were getting really frustrated with the long amounts of time of content drought uh, we would go sometimes seven eight nine months without a raid and people were really angry about that because they experienced a time where raids were actually coming out quickly with like Bolton, Vicus, Clown, Brel. The gap between those raids were only a couple months apart each time. Mm -hmm. And you could definitely make an argument that, oh, well, back then you only needed to do one hone across the board in order to get to the next raid. Granted, that was very difficult to do, you know, yeah. going from plus 16 to plus 17, 17, 18, 18 to 19 across the board in two months time was surprisingly more difficult uh, than you would imagine back then, especially because alt culture wasn't as big in the Korean version during that time. So people weren't, again, amassing as much wealth. Today, things are speeding up a lot because, you know, they want, they, they feel like raids are Lost Ark's strong point. Mm -hmm. And so they want to release a lot of raids. Uh, they change their design philosophy on raids a lot, where now they're willing to make smaller raids more often, as opposed to making these three, four, five, six gate raids now they're doing regularly two gate raids they said mm -hmm. they're 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 playing with the idea of releasing a one gate raid which is like onyxia from uh, world of warcraft or like pretty much any savage raid in final fantasy where it's just a singular boss encounter and the idea behind that is oh well rather than spending you know six months to make this grand raid of four gates we could pump out a raid every like two months and and whatnot and oftentimes they're not these raids come with new systems which kind of bog down the players a little bit mm -hmm. a kid in this case is a little bit different because she offers advanced honing mm -hmm. and advanced honing is the first system where i think people will just be happy that it exists because mm -hmm. even though it's on top of honing many people have used it as an alternative to honing in fact um my lowest three characters haven't really done traditional honing in the last 20 item levels they're almost all 1640 yet most of their items are plus 19 plus 20. Mm -hmm. and even though it's it's a system that's on top of it can be used as an alternative at least for now that can change later on of course if it feels like it's required as a mandatory thing on top of traditional honing in order to access content which can absolutely happen but for the time being in order to access contents like they mine hard echidna hard mode behemoth it's a working system that alleviates the pain points of honing the only downside to it you can't skip the animation so it's a bit <laughs> slow i know they literally just made it so that you could skip the animation on traditional honing go through it super fast then they implement advanced honing and now it's like <laughs> it's slow <laughs> uh probably an oversight sadly i'm hoping that they fix that later on down the line to be honest but implementing content fast isn't necessarily a bad thing especially because people are kind of used to lost ark being a fast updated game that um if you don't get you can't you can't please everyone mm -hmm. it's it's just a known fact if you don't put pump out updates fast then people get angry that updates aren't coming fast enough mm -hmm. and if you pump updates too fast then people feel like they've got too much to do and they can't take a break from the game it, it's it's yeah. a catch 22 and the you vocal the vocal minority of each of these camps will always be up in arms mm -hmm. regardless of what situation you take yeah and 
And which um, camp do you sit in? I guess like do um, do you want them to implement more content and systems faster, or do you feel like you know you're more of the let's go and kind of go with the flow and, and bring well, I'm in biased. Content. I'm a streamer, so obviously you know the other things that i can do that are exciting hinge on updates mm -hmm. so i i, I have a, a biased take on this where I, I i obviously want updates to come quickly whether it's raid content or otherwise raid content classes but i think to the average layman person if they had a little bit more consistency in place and time to work on these systems they'd be a little bit more satisfied um now we're coming off of Thaymine, which was the hardest raid mm -hmm. of the game's essentially history. And we're segueing into Echidna and Behemoth. And Behemoth, while it wasn't shown on the roadmap in the West, is literally right around the corner. Mm -hmm. It's very fair to assume that Behemoth will release in August, even though it wasn't on the roadmap. August wasn't on the roadmap. We should just go off of other regions. Courier released Behemoth a month and a half after Echidna and if a kidna releases in late June, then August now makes sense in early, early August, early mid August. And it's like, oh, but you know, that's not enough time. I don't think they can necessarily delay it, so to speak, because the Western version is still actively trying to catch up to the Korean version and they can't fully catch up. But an article long ago from AGS said that while we'll never catch up, they do intend to bring the time period between the Korean version and the Western version as short as three months apart. And they're not quite there yet. And if they were to delay Behemoth because people feel like they don't have enough time, now that time gap is increasing because Korea only took a month and a half between those contents. And in this case, I would say it's not a big disadvantage for these two rates to come out. And the reasons are because advanced hunting from echidna is just beneficial and the earlier mm -hmm. you get it the better because that means you can use your resource towards that system instead of honing and weapon transcendence from behemoth sucks but <laughs> you know it's it's realistically you're only going to have like one or two characters at 1640 when behemoth comes out it's mm -hmm. We, we, yeah, I, I think the Western version has already accepted at this point that they can't have a full roster of characters yep. going into a brand new content as it comes out um, for like 99.9% .9 of players. And so it shouldn't be that bad. And then the other thing is these two raids are very easy. Mm -hmm. You know, they mine very difficult raid. It can uh, much easier, probably around the difficulty of like vault and even easier than Vicus, to be honest. Wow. And then, and then behemoth is even easier than that. Yep. Like I'm talking like array levels of difficulty from, <laughs> from like before Argos. And they already said that the next raid after behemoth is, supposed to be hard again so okay they, they just didn't want to release back-to-back -back difficult raids they just wanted like these are break raids that, that, yep. that that's what they are so I, I it's it's i don't think it's that big of an issue that these these raids are releasing quickly but i can understand where people are coming from where they are worried that they don't have enough time but at least with the case of echidna the item level requirements are essentially the same as they mine yep it's also 1630 for hard mode and like you said, you know, it coming earlier as honestly for me has helped me decide completely like, do I even want to push for 1630 or do I want to just wait for it to come out and then just use that to hone myself up to 1630, which is probably what I'm going to end up doing with my characters because I'm not I, a very I, efficient I, player. I would say that the, the biggest difference between Lost Ark right now and Lost Ark from months ago with these raids, though, is... Um, the atmosphere of your weekly rating is it feels different mm -hmm. uh, because you just have these three raids that are truncated around a really specific level bracket and we've never really had that before normally the pace of lost art goes like this you reach an item level to do a raid but you still have two other gold raids that you got to do. So you do the raid before that and then the raid before that. Yep. And usually those two raids beforehand, you're so goddamn powerful that you basically skip all the mechanics on yep. the character that's at the most concurrent endgame raid. But where we are currently in Korea, we have three endgame raids that are around your item level. And we normally it's just the one. So you spend a lot more time playing your main character, even if it's these easy raids on these raids that you can't just 
instantly blast from mech to mech. Um, and that could definitely get fatiguing with time, which goes to really tell you why they made these two raids so easy because <laughs> they're, they're all high level raids, you yeah. know, <clears throat> behemoth has like friggin' uh, like 400 billion HP or something like that. <laughs> and now with the next raid coming out being a difficult raid again, normally that would be a cause for concern, but now Thamine is being pushed out of the three raids if you're accessing this raid. So now yeah. you have two easy raids and then this new difficult raid. So I think that's what they're very conscientious of. They talked about it in an article where they're worried that people will get burned out. They did diagnose that a lot of the burnout of Lost Ark does come from weeklies, which I actually do think is true. Mm -hmm. I don't actually think that a lot of the burnout comes from dailies. I do I think agree. it comes from weeklies, getting jailed, spending time in the party finder, all this kind of stuff bogs people down and eats up a majority of your time. Dailies, yeah, sure, they're kind of annoying. It'd be great to do one chaos dungeon, but at the end of the day, they only take up a very small amount of your time. Yeah, you do them across a lot of characters. It adds up, and now you're spending an hour or two but doing dailies, but ultimately a majority of your time on a week-by-week -week basis is doing weeklies. Do you think that's largely changed because of what they did back in the summer because i remember back then there was so much talk about how there was so much fatigue in the game and literally people were like quitting and boycotting lost ark until they like made the changes to like homework and things like that like do you think that the reason why we're being fatigued so much by the raids now as opposed to dailies because it's partly because of those changes that they made or do you think that it's truly is just because the raids themselves have just gotten a lot longer and a lot more tiring i think raid fatigue has always been there dailies yeah dailies was kind of like a cherry on top added kind of thing and back then dailies were more annoying because we didn't have fate embers from chaos dungeons so they weren't exciting we did two, two, two guardian raids each day yep um I'm a big proponent that hates Unas. I, I despise Unas. I want them oh, removed from the game. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, how many people are actually complaining about Unas? You know, <laughs> how many people are actually getting fatigued by Unas? They they take three they take three of those teleports, they're done with it in two minutes. They don't even yeah. think about it afterwards. They've already thought of they're already thinking about their their race I gotta go in. So it's like I hate Unas, but ultimately this is not what's causing fatigue. In Lost Ark, it's it's getting jailed in your weekly raids. It's it's just the mentality of Lost Ark players is that raids are homework. Lost Ark is the only game that I know of, the only one where your scheduled play is doing raids that came out a year ago because you know they're they they still, they still give you gold or something like that. There's no other game out there that you're still regularly as an endgame content doing raid for, raids from a year ago. And so, you know, people have done these raids so many times, they go through all these motions, and it's like... And they're still getting jailed in them. <laughs> they're, they're still getting jailed in them. They're not thinking about the run that they're currently in when they're getting jailed by a raid. They're thinking, shit, I should be on this run already. I, I, they're, mm -hmm. they're thinking about the next run. They're thinking about the next run after that run already. They're not. Their mind's not even there in the current run that they're in. So if they get jailed, you know, they're frustrated by that. And, and that, that all leads to, like, this burnout of, like, getting through your homework um, that is just so pervasive in the game. Especially now, in the Korean version, the Korean version gets quite a few new players. Its PC bong rankings are down right now because we're in content drought at the moment, mm -hmm. which always seems to happen before Loa on, but there are so many new players that are pushing into 1630 because of advanced honing and you see this all the time where just these constant jail lobbies and echidna and fame mine, which shouldn't be happening, quote unquote, in retail <laughs> lobbies, but they happen because there's yeah. just so many people that are pushing into these levels now and people get really toxic about it, even in Korean. Yeah. And I mean, I don't know, especially when I don't know, I for me, I feel like the skill level as much as we like to shit on like na eu skill and like player skill and like we put like korean players on a pedestal in my opinion like, at least i don't, I don't know I, I don't think anyone does that anymore really I, really I, I'm, of, I'm of the opinion that the average western player just because of how much smaller the region is and how much more hardcore it tends to be because the only people that are remaining are hardcore players are more skilled than the average korean players because the average korean player is just 
they just they, they just go to a PC Vong. They're they're playing the game. They're playing the game for a few hours to, a week. Uh, sure, if we if we compare like the best Korean players against the best Western players, we can make an argument there. But yep. the average Western player is most certainly better than the average Korean player. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. And the re only reason why I bring this up is that I had this discussion with chat maybe like a week and a half to two weeks ago. And they were still of the opinion of like, oh, you know, but Koreans, like it's kind of like their cult part of like their culture to play games and things like that. I'm like, but that's it. Like there, there's so many more players in Korea. That means there's so many more casual players that play the game and kind of like the overall average player skill level kind of, you know, it's it's very different from what we have here in the West because mostly people who do play in the West are quote unquote gamers because of that. It has to be. It, it's just people actually play the game casually in Korea. There, of course, there are casual players in the West as well, but I I would definitely say that a, a larger volume of Western players tends to be more conscientious of progression and. That's not even delving into the matter of things like DPS meter and available data that allows people to actually be aware that they aren't skilled. Mm -hmm. uh, there are many people who play Lost Ark that they just don't know that they're not good at the game. And mm -hmm. there's no real metrics that will tell you otherwise that are provided by the game itself. Yeah. I 100% agree, and I've talked about this plenty, plenty of times in the past. And for me personally, and people may not agree with me, I think that I think that Smilegate should have personal DPS meters, and that way they can kind of use that to see their own damage and how their performance is. But it doesn't have to be a toxic thing like they're always saying about DPS meters, about people, you know, using those numbers to be toxic to one another. That way they're only seeing their own data. And if they do want to share that data with other people, they can do that to help get feedback. I don't know. That's just and my people thoughts. people always find a way to utilize that data to gatekeep and other MMOs. But I think at the end of the day, having that data and there's a lot of benefits to it. Mm -hmm. Um the number one be thing being it gives people a goal to work towards. Mm -hmm. We run out of goals to work towards with a lot of these older raids, but if you had that data available, you could always constantly work towards, you know, bettering yourself in a raid, yeah. bettering your uptime, all that kind of stuff. It makes them exciting again, not as mundane. Mm -hmm. Especially as a support, because as a support, you it's really hard to get information on like your you know attack buff uptime, brand uptime, like you know things like that that actually affect the um, rate in general. Whereas DPS have a little bit more kind of insight into it with kind of the numbers that they're doing and like comparing each other uh, with like the the end MVP screen and things like that. Mm. Yeah, but I mean. I think in terms of like things that I had questions for you about that is about it. Um, and I'd love to open it up to kind of, and I don't know what your timing and schedule is. I don't know how long, much longer you can do this for. Um, do you have like a hard stop at any time? Of course, I think your stream starts at 12, right? But you might want to have some time before that. Oh no, my, my stream started like three hours ago. Oh shoot, really? Well, <laughs> it's fine. I'm not, I'm not in any rush. My, I think my own viewers know I, I just turn on the stream whenever I feel like it at this point. Got it. Well, again, thank you for doing this. Um, I don't want to keep you for too much longer, but <laughs> it's, um, it's not a big deal. Don't, don't worry about it. I can stay as long as you need. Okay. Um, I wanted to move into like more of like a Q&A type of situation from chat. Um, and I've kind of been collecting questions here and there as they've popped up. Um, to ask, but as we're talking as well for chat, you guys, if you want to pop in your questions, um, hi highly recommend and welcome you guys doing that. But I guess do you, first question that I had from like uh, from Moonshine Blade, do you have any thoughts on like um, you know the Chinese server um, at the moment? Like, where do you think that? the Chinese server is getting like one preferential treatment um, 
in overall kind of like the all the different regions at the moment and do you think that they're going to be like super super pay to win and uh, because of that be changing kind of the balance of the game in general i mean the game's already pay to win honestly so <laughs> they, they, they can't really add that much more they actually tried to they tried to add uh legendary outfits that offered one percent more stat and then they had a huge backlash on that and they had to recall that um because you know that that was like pay to win that required real money that you couldn't really grind at all and actually surprisingly chinese players were upset by that but i do think that uh I, I do think that to some degree or another the chinese version and any additional version if they ever make any additional region beyond the chinese version uh does affect the development pipeline and part of that this is just a very small part where we're still feeling the repercussions today is the gaming industry had a explosive growth during the COVID 2020 to 2022 periods where um, just games were making so much money and companies were able to bring on so much headcount. And as people have transitioned back into regular lifestyle after COVID, uh, a lot of these game companies, they kind of have felt the lingering effects and have to had to do a lot of layoffs, mm -hmm. which if you know, if you've been paying attention to like Twitter and stuff like that, you'll see that a lot of these companies indie or major are performing these major layoffs. And um, especially in Korea, not only did layoffs occur, but on top of that, Korea in the video game industry has one of the most rampant poaching cultures in the video game industry where they, they will constantly steal employees from one another with better offers, better pay, better benefits mm -hmm. uh, to, to try and scout talent. And no matter what, I, 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 I do strongly believe that they are lacking uh, in manpower. They, they are understaffed. And I used to do this thing. I haven't done it in quite a while, but I can just predict that if I were to look at Smilegate's hiring listing right now on their website, there's probably a ton of uh, positions related to Lost Ark that uh -huh. they are hiring for and have been hiring for for many, 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 many months. Um, that was the case like a year ago. I'm sure it's the case now. It's just they're constantly trying to fill these positions. And as long as their positions are not filled, they are understaffed. Mm, interesting. And you think that a lot of that is just because manpower for these positions don't really exist. Like where, like it's very hard to find talent for a lot of these, especially senior positions and executive positions. Like it's so hard to actually get people to apply to them in do general. You think, do you think that's might be why the, our current director exists in his position now? Because I, I feel like in my opinion, right and like my thoughts i thought they were gonna go external because you know the three bozos were in place and took you know the director spot and originally that didn't go all that hot i was not expecting at all that they would take a one of them and put them in the director spot do you think that's... i didn't think i i didn't think they were going to do that either but after they installed him into that position i kind of realized oh okay this guy's actually not that bad I think what actually ended up happening was they were in a temporary position of director and there was the three of them, so they couldn't really make any decision over the other. And they needed someone to become the director that was actually like, they kind of knew the game to some degree, so they picked one of those three guys. You know, um, he worked on a lot of the prominent systems of the game. And now that he's the sole director, he can kind of make actual decisions compared to before. I think if we brought on just some random dude from another company to become director that has no knowledge or no know-how of Lost Ark whatsoever, it could be way worse. <laughs> it could be far worse. I think that's true, for sure. Um, though, I don't know. I always, as much, like, there's also there's one side of the coin of that where it could have been worse, but also another side of the coin where it's like, it could have been a nice breath of fresh air into the lost art oh, like, game oh, like different perspective kind of exactly deal. yeah because i don't know my and here is again my opinions coming into this right i feel like 
one of the reasons why Lost Ark isn't able to, I guess, be super successful here in the West is because of its, I guess, really catering to like the hardcore audience. And like, because of that, there's a lot of people who feel ostracized from the game. And I feel like, you know, there was could have been a world where um, it could have been more similar to like other games like Final Fantasy or whatever that had more of these kind of more casual aspects. And I think partly too, like I remember like Gold River really advocating for like, you know, more fun things to do in the game. Right. And like more of these fun activities that never ended up coming to fruition like you know let's say like the moba thing or like you know they were like doing a little while like you can create your own I, well, it was, I don't quite remember what the exact kind of like um content was but there was a lot more of like this fun content that more players from casual to hardcore could play yeah enjoy. of course i i i think it's really underestimated how important the casual player base of a game is your game cannot exist without its casual player base. Mm -hmm. And it might seem like a lot of the people who speak up on topics are hardcore players, but that's because a lot of the people that are enjoying the game and that are playing the game, they are casual players that are very complacent. They just do very little and they don't really speak up on subjects, but they make up the lion's share of the player base and the game's lifeblood. And unfortunately, with Lost Ark, its inherent design is hardcore. As a new player, you can't make perk progress unless you start the game and you immediately group up with others and do high-level raids. There's no other alternative pathing for gearing or really anything, which is why we stress the importance of solo raids. And mm -hmm. it's very funny, but back in Season 1, you could have geared up through PvP, you could have geared up through um, chaos dungeons which was group content at that time you could have geared up through doing island souls but they had to remove all those systems because not enough people were interacting with them but i think that was a wrong approach to take and a big reason why games like final fantasy and world of warcraft are as successful as they are is they offer many 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 forms of alternatives for people to create goals for themselves that isn't strictly hey do this rate this it's very important because a lot of people out there they they don't want to do group rating and that's uh, or or they put they force themselves to do group rating yeah. even though they might not want to but because there, there is no other option uh but things would be different if they had alternatives mm -hmm. and that's kind of one of the reasons why originally i thought it would have been nice if there was maybe an outsider perspective because lost ark has been catered to this kind of hardcore audience so long that if to me felt like you know, if they got somebody else from internal, the direction of the game would very much largely stay similar to what they were doing in the past. And there would kind of be I think a they are. I think they are taking steps towards making the game better for new players. The horizontal express being a permanent thing, the way better Super Makoko Expresses. I mean, you guys remember when Super Makoko Expresses only got you to like 14, 15. Yeah. <laughs> they gave you like some level five gems, Paul Tree, yeah. three by four rentals. And that's way better today. It's oh, just now, now the game needs a better way of segueing these new players and converting them into long term players by allowing them to ease into the game's existing ecosystem. And Solar Raids can definitely do that because it just lets them experience the actual gameplay of the game at their own pace you know what if you're a brand new player right let's say you're a brand new player and you start playing lost ark today you get all this free shit and then you you want to join a raid and you get gate kept immediately well you're being gate kept from literally the one thing that makes lost ark lost ark you can't play the game. At least with these other games like FF and WoW, there's alternatives. You can gear up through other ways, but you know, Lost Ark, it doesn't have that segue that allows you to integrate yourself um, without putting in quite a bit of meaningful work. And even then, there's a lot of people that get like raid anxiety and all that kind of stuff, and mm -hmm. they don't even want to. Yeah, I agree. Do you think that they should implement solo raids in a way where it will completely replace like uh, group rating because personally no, 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 yeah no. i don't think that that's healthy either and i feel like a lot of people kind of think that 
that's kind of the direction that they should go because they're tired of being gay kept. They're tired of not being able to get in raids. They're tired of this raid anxiety and fatigue and they just kind of want to do solo content. Whereas for me, I think that if they end up doing that, it's just kind of going to be the death of the game. It's 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 good to make, create options. People should have options. We play a game that is inherently a game about efficiency. People try to spend their time in the most efficient manner possible. And so if group raids are going to provide you more rewards for the same amount of time spent or a similar amount of time spent, obviously the people who do group raids will continue doing group raids. But if people feel like they aren't comfortable with doing group raids, then the solo raids exist and there should still be meaningful progression from the solo raids. Solo raids should still give gold. They should still give the time gated materials just less. And that way, you know, you can try for group content, but if it doesn't pan out, at least you have solo raids. At least you can make some meaningful progression for the week. At least you can pan it around your schedule and your time and you don't have to blame what other people are doing, screwing up your raids or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. You know, just just giving people options is just way healthier for a week by week basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I guess kind of the last question I have, uh, because, again, thank you so much for kind of giving your time to me and to us in the community to talk about this stuff. We really appreciate it. But I don't want to hold you for too long. The last question I have for you is really around like, Lost Ark, AGS, and the Western version. Like, what do you think AGS has done a really good job of with the Western version of Lost Ark when comparing it to the Korean version? And what would you like to see them improve on or do more of in the future? Well, funny enough, I actually think that the Western version did a pretty good job when it comes to two things. One, monetization. They did take out a lot of the monetization in Korea that I think Western players would really hate. And they also influenced the monetization in a way that made some changes in the Korean version because it existed. It's wild. I know when I say monetization, <laughs> cause we think of these like $50 <laughs> packages that aren't worth it. And we think of like, Oh, people are RMTing, but they did take out a lot of things. I'll give you some examples. One in Korea, in order to change your pet stats, you have to use blue crystals. It's yep. not a free thing. And when you do change your pet stats, it's a random amount of stats that you get. It's not you don't get like 10 percent spec or something like that. You get one to 10 percent. It's a it's a random amount and it's blue crystals each time to make that attempt. Mm -hmm. That's a one time cost, but it's still a cost that usually yep. sets people back like a thousand plus blue crystals that you don't have to spend on the Western version. There's crystal and aura, which isn't required for mandated for gameplay. But a lot of people in the West ended up getting a lot of crystal and aura either through gameplay or through exploiting that deal cross region <laughs> um but in any case if you want crystal and aura you can literally just buy it for blue crystal in korea not only is it way more expensive to get the same benefits it's twice as expensive in fact it's 20 dollars. but we don't have a blue crystal option you have to spend real money and because of that a lot of people in korea they don't play with crystal and aura at all because the benefits really? just aren't they, they just aren't worth 20 dollars a month to them essentially um, pet stats in Korea are rental. You don't actually get pet stats permanently for free. You have mm -hmm. to pay blue crystals every single month for that. It's blue crystals yep. though, but still, it's still an expenditure. And the mileage system, which is something that a lot of Western players, funny enough, actually seem to want, is uh, actually not great because it encourages people to spend egregious sums of money for things that um, are just cosmetic but uh, i mean we we're talking about like oh i want that outfit how much is it oh well if you want it you have to spend two thousand five hundred dollars on other shit and then you get and then you get enough points to buy it oh these emotes that the ags is charging us fifty dollars for i want it oh well if you want it in korea you have to spend five hundred dollars yeah for the same pack that you you know on, on other shit and you, you can have it for free quote unquote mm -hmm. um so they did a lot of stuff with monetization, monetization that was good. And then overall, I would say that just generally speaking, I found the localization to be pretty good in the West. Better <laughs> than I've seen in, in, in most games for sure. Yeah, some of the renames are questionable, like Ladon from Echidna, <laughs> uh, Scrapper from Infighter. Mm. No one calls it Machinist. Everyone calls it Scouter. Yeah. Um, 
But I thought the voice acting in most of the segments were okay. There were, there are times where the voice acting is like really weak, like in South Burn and stuff like that. But uh, a lot of the voice actors, I thought they did a really good job. And I liked I liked seeing that the game was available in a lot of languages, which unfortunately also affects the localization process because AGS has to outsource localization in all these languages to other companies to translate mm -hmm. all these strings of text. And that slows down the process as well and it contributes to that like staggered, patched cycle but at the end of the day the availability to many different regions and languages is, is, a, is a positive thing it is mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what would you like to see them do more of or improve on in the future uh i'd like to see them be a bit more communicative I, I think they've made some steps towards that with like henry's videos yep. and the patch notes websites way better now than what it was like a year ago um so i, I think if they can keep going down that route and keep people in the know and kind of keep people integrated with what's going on in the in what the developers are doing um because internally publishers are always aware of at least six months ahead of the pipeline so mm -hmm. ags I assure you right now, they already know what's going to happen in the game six months from now in the Korean version. They already know what's happening in the summer, what the rate is, etc. I, I, I assure you that. But while they don't have to share that kind of information, it would be good to keep, like, keep people excited and keep people in the know because ultimately that knowledge does help a lot of people stick with the game mm -hmm. if you didn't know that the korean version was releasing certain contents you would be potentially more likely to drop out of the game after getting burnt out on some of these systems mm -hmm. but the knowledge that certain content is coming out or certain systems that are coming out in the future keeps you on the grind it, it does it, it, yep. it keeps you motivated it, it's 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 that goal that you set for yourself that keeps you in an mmo mm-hmm yeah, so you don't think like the roadmaps that we're getting are enough. You want to see even more information or maybe more often from them. Yeah, I, th I think that would be just good in general. And then, I mean, the way the way that the the game is now, we, 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 we just talked about how Western players are like really hardcore, but at the same time, they also like some pampering is needed because yep. The the content cycle is accelerated, and even if the raids are nerfed, and even if you're getting certain things faster, I think it's just good to appease. So you know, even if it's even if it's not like a permanent fixture, just having like better events in game mm -hmm. would oh, would agree. do a lot of good. Our events the, are abysmal. The, the recent stuff with like Super Makoko, and that's great. That's great. Keep going down that route and keep making the events better and better because like. Whenever like a new person comes along, it's like, hey, I used to play Lost Ark back in the day. Is now a good time to start? You want to be able to tell them, yeah, now's a great time to start. The events are great. They're solo raids. You know, things are, things are great right now. You want to be able to say that. You don't want to you don't want to go to them and be like, no, stay away from this game because that kind of <laughs> that kind of cynicism is is infectious and it, it makes people feel bad about playing the game that they're playing. It does happen, though. And, you know, I definitely get a, quite a few people like, hey, is it a good time to start the game now? And it's like, if we're not in the middle of a Makoko Express or something like that, I'm like, maybe wait a couple months or like a month or something like that. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and I thought you were talking about events like, you know, our freaking uh, like Naruti Racing and those type of events because uh, those... they have not been great recently. Uh, they're they're never great. It, it's funny because you say they're not great, but they're they're even worse in Korea. <laughs> so, oh, really? Yeah, our our shops are even worse, and it's just. A, I think I think your shops are actually slightly better because of that accelerated time thing. That it, it's it's just the the ripple effect of like they don't consider how much a single player makes uh when it comes to like the materials that they're uh, gathering in a week, right? They never consider how much one person makes. They're thinking, oh, how does the economy at large shift because we add like five more leap stones to mm -hmm. their weekly payout of, 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 of event rewards and whatnot. It's like, they don't think, oh, five leap stones, that's, fuck, that's nothing, that's, that's, that's less than a tenth of a tap. They think, oh, it's five leap stones times this many players. Mm -hmm. that, that's what they're thinking about. Or the, which... the overall effect in the economy. Exactly, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I, I was even more talking about, like, the actual 
events themselves as in the activity oh, the design of them yeah hey, man, I, don't don't shit on the rooney racing i'm not rooney shitting on the rooney racing the rooney racing is great but the last couple ones especially our anniversary one was actually the worst i don't know if you saw what that was but it literally was standing in one spot pressing f5 on a pinata for like two minutes nice it was not good. I I actually made a video about that because I was so up in arms about how bad that event was for an anniversary event. Sometimes they don't actually make the event. They don't actually make events. What what they do is they just recycle an old one because they, they don't have time to work on something new. They're working on other stuff. So they're like, OK, we'll just use this again. <laughs> and some, they're just like low hanging fruit, like bad but easy events that they could just rehash change change some text strings and adjust the reward slightly on i i mean i it, it it the thing is the reason why it comes to so much in mind for me is because i actually started an account on a character on east and i don't have that many characters over there and basically i was forced to do the events to be able to actually buy out the shop so <laughs> i feel uh, like for yeah. the or hardcore players, it's like whatever. You just do Chaos Dungeons and, um, and Guardian Raids is fine. But for people who are like those casuals, like we were talking about earlier, I feel like it actually is a big like issue and problem for those people because they're just doing such a boring event for because they're forced to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people without like six characters, seven characters, eight characters, people are running like three, two characters, like they're forced to do it. Uh, they got the time. They don't have eight characters, so you know they can spend it pressing F five, and they're waiting in PF getting gate kept anyway. So you know, <laughs> let them press F five. Oh my god, that's why is that so true? Why is that so true? But okay, I don't want to keep you for much longer, say I really, really appreciate the time that you've given us here to talk about game design, talk about Lost Ark and everything. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for taking time out of your streaming schedule to do this. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and I guess before we kind of close it off, um, actually, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I was, was going to say, you know, to thank me. Yeah, there's always this bit of a disconnect between the uh, Korean Lost Ark streamers and the Western Lost Ark streamers. And um, I'm just humbled that you care enough about my opinion to have me on. So thank you for that. Oh, I mean, I've been following you since like the Maple Story two days, man. Like literally, I you were yeah, I'm happy to see that your content has been steadily on the up and up. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. But yes, um, I guess you know if you want, if you, um, go ahead and like drop your socials um, and things where people can follow you. Yeah, you can find me on twitch.tv slash miso xshiro. <laughs> so make sure to drop me a follow and use my, your Prime subscription on me. <laughs> oh, no, thank you, thank you. But yes, twitch.tv slash Saint Tone and uh, YouTube at Saint Tone as well. Do you have a Twitter or anything like that? I do, but I don't post on it pretty much ever. So, <laughs> got it, got it. Well, again, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it, and I hope to be able to continue to chat with you more and kind of, you know, get to know you more in the future. Because that's probably part of the reason why I did this podcast, invited you on as well, because I always wanted to get to know you a little better. Yep, looking forward to it, man. I hope you have a great stream, and looking forward to see more content from you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Adios. All right. Bye-bye.